Uh, let's see. All right. Welcome everybody to the second quarantine canteen. We again have, this is like uh, the Brady Bunch. We have Jared in Germany, we have Delaware, we have DC, we have Pennsylvania, New York. Uh, Randy, Randy say hi. Randy is uh, in New York. No, I'm in Jersey. You're in Jersey. Oh, you're in New Jersey. That's right. <laughs> From the World War One Historical Association. Um, Randy, tell these guys what um, what's coming up this year for the association. Well, we we'll see what's coming up. I mean, it it depends. It's a little dependent on what uh, what this virus does. We have a seminar. Um, at the Kansas City Memorial Museum in, um, this is gonna be in late October. And their, the seminar normally goes Friday and Friday to about noontime Saturday. And then the League of World War I Historical, League of World War I Arrow Historians is having their seminar on, um, they're gonna piggyback on that on Saturday and Sunday. So it'll be a real full weekend in Kansas City. Um, Plus, we also publish a journal called World War One Illustrated. We get two issues out. The first one's going to be out in May of this year, and the next one will be out in November. And in between, we do that two times a year, and two times a year we do the. Um, we have a publication called Here and There with the World War One Historical Association, which is a little bit more of a folksy newsletter, and just kind of keeps people up to date as to what everyone's working on. Um, we've got a lot of people interested in restarting chapters that's not so current for you guys other than what, what Kevin's doing here. But um, we're looking at starting, re building a chapter in the Minnesota area, restarting a chapter in Kansas City and restarting a chapter down in the uh, Florida area or the Southeast. So a lot oh, going on actually. Yeah, and something I'm working on is having a symposium in November. And uh, so I'm working on the details of how that would, um, shake out to actually have a day of talks and presentations, you know, not living history, but more along the lines of, a, I wanna say academic, but more along the lines of a symposium. So um, after, after Veterans Day, so it wouldn't tie up any other um, living history or events like that. So you'll hear more about that, hopefully in a, in a few weeks, because I have lots of free time right now. Um, uh, thanks, Randy. So this week, we want to talk about the Navy. Um, last week was such a, a, a great get together, so fun with Todd and Bob and Chris, um, that Luke and Tom jumped up and said they wanted to do um, a little bit about what they've been researching. And it blows me away that Luke wants to do it because Luke just did an awesome presentation yesterday from Hagley. Um, Luke, would you like to go first? Sure, no problem. All right, I'm gonna put you on the spotlight. Oh my gosh, look what Jared has. <laughs> I have something to show you guys after, um, after the talk. Uh, let me put you on spotlight. The floor is yours, Luke. All right, so as uh, many of you know, and if you don't already, I am uh, one of the members of the Cruiser Olympia Living History crew in Philadelphia. So uh, we're pretty fortunate that we've got a ship, which was an actual Great War ship. It's pretty awesome. So the ship entered service in 1895 and uh, decommissioned for the final time in 1922. So uh, she did everything from being the lead ship in the Battle of Manila Bay on May 1st, 1898, through training cruises with the uh, midshipmen from the Naval Academy to convoy duty in the Great War to being in Murmansk, Russia in the Great War to uh, being present for Billy Mitchell's bombing test to show that aircraft could indeed sink ships. And so her last big thing was bringing back the unknown soldier from World War I. So uh, one of the things that we do aboard as a living history crew is to explain what it is to be aboard a ship like that. And one of the things we get asked pretty frequently is, so if you're going to shoot at something, how do you hit it? So we, uh, one of, one of my particular research areas and things that I think is fun and awesome and interesting is the uh, concepts of fire control. So for the U.S. Navy, fire control in this era is not about putting out fires. It's about controlling the fire of your guns. So whenever you're thinking about putting out fires, that's more damage control than necessarily fire control. So if you see the, the words fire control, that's what it means. Is it's about shooting at stuff. 
so during Olympia's life, so going from the 1890s up through the Great War, you've got a, some serious changes in the U.S. Navy's method of gunnery and how you think about combat with ships, that you've got uh, guns that can maybe shoot for a mile, two miles. By the time you get to World War I, you've got guns that can shoot five, six, and further miles. So uh, they call it the Dreadnought era, based on the, uh, the British ship, the HMS Dreadnought. So you have a ship that's got all large caliber guns. That way you can concentrate the fire of a battery on something a long way away. So this is a game changer, and everybody else has to work to catch up. But one of the, the bits that you have to think about in all this is how do you hit the thing that you're shooting at? And especially whenever you've got guns that can increasingly fire a long way away. So when uh, thinking through all this with Cruiser Olympia, I took it upon myself to uh, do a lot of research into this and actually acquire bits and pieces of fire control equipment, which I will show you right now. So I'm going to get all fancy here. And tap you in to my remote camera so you're going to see some of my uh, cool stuff here and uh, in addition to my cats so here's Gabe passed out on the chair and there's two in the spider looking thing over there that's Elliot and Lucian so they're probably going to hop up in a few minutes and come over and try to talk to you so whenever you're going to shoot at something a long way away you need to know two main things how far away something is and then you need to know the relative angle from you to what you're shooting at. Then on top of that, you need to know how fast the thing's going. That way you can uh, think about uh, where you're going to shoot at it. Because if you're shooting at a moving target, you're not shooting at it where it is. You've got to shoot at it where it's going to be. So you've got to think about where something is in time. Think about the world in 3D. So one of the main bits that you need to figure this out is this instrument, which is called a Polaris also known as a dummy compass. And so the idea with this thing is that you, you set it up so that it uh, faces along the center line of your ship. This moving dial, it's set up so that the dial itself can move. That way you can adjust it back and forth. And then this piece moves. So if you're going to navigate, you can uh, set it up to true north and then use it to uh, look at things on land like steeples of churches or navigational beacons. That way you can figure out where you are relative to something fixed in space. But if you're going to use it for gunnery, you set this north up to the indicator here at the top. And then you look through this. It's like looking at a gun sight. You've got the uh, hair in the front and then you've got this little notch in the back. And so once you sight it in on the thing you're looking at, when you look at it over the top, it gives you a relative angle of where things are from you. So this is a technology that doesn't really change from the Spanish-American War up through the Great War era. So this is a pretty easy thing to figure out. The harder bit is figuring out the distance of something from you. So you can do this a couple of ways. One of the ways that you could do it pretty early on, this is something they figured out in the 19th century, is to use a sextant. Uh, and so oh. you can uh, use this to, to figure out range. I mean, how it works is you look through this eyepiece, and you've got two mirrors, one here and one here. So whenever you're looking at the image through a sextant, you're uh, looking at the horizon, and then you're looking at the sun. So what you're going to do is bring the sun down to the horizon and then you can measure the angle so what this is doing is measuring an angle that's what you're reading off this little scale here at the bottom so uh, you can use it to figure out the distance from you to something but you've got to do a lot of math and uh, you also have to know a few things a few variables which you you can't easily pick up so a u.s navy officer bradley fisk started thinking about this problem and built this instrument which is called a stedimeter and so it works uh, off the Pythagorean theorem, which is how all these things really work. So it's using a right triangle. Uh, there's a, it's, it's a pretty ingenious instrument. So you've got this sliding scale. You need to dial in the masthead height or the width of the thing that you're looking at. So if you know the height of the ship that you're sighting in on or the length of the ship, then you can turn this little knob at the end. It moves this entire apparatus back and forth. So once you get it sighted in, you look through the eyepiece, you've got two mirrors, 
there's one here, and then one here, and you turn this dial. So as you turn it, it moves. You can see the piece moving up and down there. So what you're doing is you're, you're looking at the two images kind of like you do okay. with a sextant. So what it does is you, you're looking at an image when you're looking through this thing in the beginning, you're looking at an image that's whole. Meaning that uh, if you see a ship, it's going to essentially look like this. When you adjust the instrument, you're going to bring the top of one image to the bottom of the other. And it doesn't really make sense when you're looking at it. It's a pretty counterintuitive way to work. But whenever you do that, that's essentially measuring an angle. You dial in one leg of the triangle, and then what it's doing is measuring the long leg of the triangle. So you read off the distance on this scale. So Bradley Fisk used an instrument like this in the Battle of Manila Bay. He uh, was actually uh, had himself tied into one of the fighting tops in his ship. That way he could use it to range in some of the uh, ships that the U.S. fleet were fighting or were, were shooting at during the Battle of Manila Bay in 1898. So uh, one of the problems with this, of course, is that you need to know the height of the thing that you're looking at. So how do you figure that out? You've got uh, printed sources like this, the Naval Annual, Jane's Fighting Ships, otherwise, that uh, give you that information. And uh, whether or not you knew all this, uh, whenever you look at these books, all of the drawings that are in them are drawn to scale. And so it doesn't tell you exactly what the masthead height or length is. You have to take a set of dividers, use the scale that's in the book, take the set of dividers and measure it out. So this is for the uh, German battleship Frederick the Great, and uh, you can see where I figured out uh, the length 564 and a quarter feet and the masthead height of 100 feet. So it's a pretty neat way to do it, but you know there's a lot of information, a lot of variables, a lot of inputs that you have to think about. So the British firm Barr and Stroud had been working on making this simple by the 1890s and came up with this lovely instrument which I feel pretty fortunate that I've got the transit chest and all the spare tools and doodads to go with it. And this is called a coincidence rangefinder. And this is a very small version. This is a, a foot and a half wide that these were uh, not really used for gunnery so much as station keeping. So if you're going to be uh, doing navigation or sailing with other ships, you can use this to figure out how far away you are from other ships, things that are relatively close in. So it's a pretty sophisticated instrument, and one of the, the really neat things about it is that you've got two fixed prisms. I'll try to get myself in the frame here. So there's two, there's two prisms. There's one in the right side, one in the left side, and you've got an adjustment, which is this little thumb wheel at the bottom. So when you turn it, it turns the adjustable prism. So you've got the other one that's fixed into place. So back to the Pythagorean theorem, you've got a 90 degree angle here. You've got a fixed width, which is how far away both of these are, these lenses are from each other. Whenever you adjust it, it automatically measures the angle. And so it's solving for the long leg of the triangle. That way you don't have to know how wide a ship is. You don't have to know how tall a ship is. This does a lot of that math for you. So it's pretty easy to use an instrument like this to figure out how far away something is. So let me show you what it looks like when you look through that lens. We're going to get really fancy on you here. So when you look through the eyepiece, there's two sides, a left and a right. When you look through the left, if you, if you look down, you're going to see a range scale which is uh, what you see here. So this tells you in yards how far away the thing you're looking at is. And notice that uh, on the left, the 100 is spaced at all the, the spacing is, is wider apart on the left than it is on the right. So that's called a logarithmic scale. So as you go right, the numbers get closer together. And that's all about having to do the proper trig to make sure the math, everything out so that your, your lenses and everything work right and that it gives you the proper angle. So whenever you look straight ahead, you see this pointer, which is in the center, and that's how you can find what you're looking at. You've got a relatively narrow field of view when you look through this rangefinder, so you need to use the left side to figure out what it is you're looking at. 
when you look through the right side, this is what you're seeing. So it's an image broken up into two pieces. You've got this little strip, which is right down the center. So this is called a coincidence rangefinder. So unlike the statimeter where you're breaking an image in half, with this one, you're looking at two images and you're trying to bring them together. So you're bringing them into coincidence. So if you see the strip at the center and that little white line, what you want to do is turn that thumb wheel so that it moves that white line over to the left. So if I were adjusting this, I'd move that white line to the left, and this is looking at the door frame in my house, so that it would uh, bring everything into alignment. So after everything comes into alignment, I would look down in the left side, and that would tell me the range from me to the thing that I'm looking at. So it's a pretty sophisticated little instrument in a, in a neat little piece. The U.S. Navy picked up on these pretty quickly because they wanted to figure out the problem of fire control. And so Cruiser Olympia actually carried one of these. So this is an image of Cruiser Olympia from uh, 1922. And uh, this is what she looked like during World War I. Olympia carried two of these. The first one you can see just aft of the five-inch gun atop the armored conning tower. So Olympia carried a nine-foot version of one of these. So with these coincidence rangefinders, the shorter they are, the, the shorter the distance that they can measure. So with a nine foot, it's a minimum of 1,000 yards out to about 20,000 yards. And that was pretty standard for a U.S. cruiser of that period. So Olympia had a, a full battery of five-inch guns. So she also had a similar rangefinder aft atop the radio house, or you can see the guy sitting there just after the mass. That's where the second rangefinder would be aboard cruiser Olympia. And to uh, give you an idea of what this thing would have looked like a little closer in, this is a uh, photograph from the Cruiser Olympia from 1917. And uh, you can see the rangefinder here atop the armored conning tower. So this is a British Barr and Stroud version that uh, the U.S. Navy bought from Barr and Stroud in, in Glasgow, Scotland. Something interesting to point out about this is that the guy using it and I know this doesn't really come in clearly in this image, but the guy using this instrument was a yeoman. So uh, the U.S. Navy didn't have a fire controlman rate when the Great War started. So they had to figure out, you know, who's going to run these things. So they picked yeoman to do it. And part of the reason why is that you have to uh, have people that know how to do math, know how to handle sensitive instruments. So these people were folks that could use stuff like typewriters and ditto machines for the period, ditto machines, all the type of apparatus. But they're also people used to doing pretty close tolerances and measurements. Because one of the tricks with using these instruments is you've got to know how to use it, and you've got to be able to read it pretty quickly and read it under pressure. I can't just walk up to you and hand you a rangefinder like this and tell you to use it. It's not an intuitive thing. So uh, part of the reason why it was so important to get female yeomen into the Navy during World War I is that they needed a lot of the male yeomen to run fire control equipment. So uh, one of the reforms of the Navy after World War I was to uh, create the fire controlman rate. That way you have a dedicated group of people that do nothing but use fire control instruments. So with, uh, this is what this uh, instrument looks like up close. This is called the FQ2 type. Uh, so this is what Olympia would have carried. This is uh, the schematic from the Barr and Stroud company of, of what this instrument would have looked like. So Olympia and other ships carried these. So um, this is the cruiser Olympia in the USS Florida going through the uh, Panama Canal in 1922. So this is a neat comparison of a battleship and a, uh, a cruiser. So with Olympia, you can see the stand that that uh, rangefinder sits atop uh, right there on top of the, um, the armored con. But then you can see the uh, rangefinder on top of turret number two. So whenever a lot of these battleships went into production, they weren't thinking about integrated fire control. This is something that the U.S. Navy was trying to work out in a big way before the Great War started, and, and we're most of the way there that you had two competing companies in the United States, one being Sperry Gyroscope Company out of New York, and then the Ford Instrument Company out of New York, and the Ford Instrument Company was formed out of Sperry Gyroscope. So they were trying to figure out a way to make rangefinders better, but then also integrate things like a Polaris and the rangefinder so that you can have some type of a instrument that would make all these calculations rather than some guy sitting down inside the ship figuring it out with a slide rule. 
uh, but this is not a problem that the Navy was able to adequately solve when the Great War started because that cut the U.S. Navy off from a lot of uh, information that they needed to uh, to figure it out because they were taking the taking their lead from the British Admiralty on this. So you can see here, you know, part of how the U.S. Navy was trying to solve this problem. This is the uh, the last two turrets on a uh, Florida or Delaware class battleship. So you can see uh, there's a rangefinder on both turrets. So uh, the Navy hadn't even settled, the U.S. Navy hadn't even settled in on what type of rangefinders it wanted to use during the Great War and even after. And uh, the American Navy's inability to, to settle on a fire control program worried the heck out of the British Royal Navy, especially when the American battleships joined the uh, Royal Navy battleship fleet. Because one of the things that they had noticed about American gunners is that they didn't have as sophisticated of a fire control system or as complete of a grasp of how it works. So the British, one of the first tasks of the British Royal Navy was to train American gunners and American officers, gunnery officers, in how to do proper fire control. That way they could uh, get up to British standards. But there's all sorts of fun and interesting photographs of these rangefinders. Uh, this is one which I absolutely love. This uh, photograph is called Looking for Subs, and uh, it's of a, uh, of a, a Salem-class cruiser, the, the bow end of a Salem-class cruiser. So uh, you see a, a three-inch anti-aircraft gun pointing straight up, then a five-inch gun just forward, but then you've got uh, this 12-foot bar and stroud range finder, which is on a movable stand just out on deck. And so uh, with these range finders, they were made so they could fold them up and put them away. Uh, there wasn't even a standard place for them uh, during the Great War. And one of the things I absolutely love about this photo is the officer using it's got his hat turned around backward <laughs> and uh, got his sleeves rolled up. So uh, anybody who uh, says that officers didn't even roll up their sleeves and uh, kind of look like dirt bags sometimes, I've got a photographic evidence here to prove you wrong. But it, it's an interesting problem uh, that the Navy was was working hard to solve during the Great War and and never – completely figured out that uh, there was a lot of instrumentation, a lot of competing companies, competing ideas about how this worked, that the uh, U.S. Navy didn't settle into a complete kind of overall fire control program until the mid-1920s going into the 1930s. So around the uh, Washington Naval Treaty era with some of the, the new cruisers and battleships coming online during that time, that's the first time you see Navy ships that have a fully integrated fire control system that brings in things like the Polaris and the, uh, the uh, range finders, but then the next generation after that, you've got a, a, what's called a fire director. So this kind of puts a uh, Polaris and the range finder in one, and so these are mounted up high in ships. But this kind of gets us into a different era, and it's a, a different sermon for a different Sunday, as it were. So there's, a, again, a lot of moving parts to this, and uh, neat instrumentation to think about. So it makes for a, a fun interpretive problem aboard Cruiser Olympia, but it's been a fun research problem for me to figure out what all these bits and pieces were and to uh, dig into the Navy manuals and uh, even into some really obscure stuff. One of the most fun being uh, this book, uh, which is called The Groundwork of Practical Naval Gunnery. So uh, this book is all the math that you didn't want to do in high school. So it's uh, pages and pages of trig tables to uh, figure out things like how uh, wind speed affects a bullet in flight or a projectile in flight, about how a ship speed, the enemy's speed, even where you are in the world. So you have to make sure whenever you're shooting like 14, 12, 14 inch guns that uh, you know which hemisphere you're in because the earth will turn underneath you. It takes so long for a projectile to go through the air and hit its target when you're shooting at four or five miles distance that the earth will actually turn underneath the projectile. So you have to figure that in too. But that's what this book is all about, is all the math behind that. Cool. So it's been a, a lot of fun to figure it out. It's, an, again, an interesting interpretive problem, uh, figuring out how they did it and what it all looked like, but then how to explain it, too. Does anybody have any questions for Luke? Yeah, I have one. Hey, Luke, um, question. Do they factor in, like, air and barometric pressure, like air temp, barometric pressure into their equations as well? Absolutely. So part of the book that I just showed, that's uh, what is figured in. So you figure in uh, air temperature, barometric pressure, the temperature in the magazines, because you need to keep the magazines a steady temperature because the propellant temperature is important and all this. Uh, standard weights for projectiles, standard weights for propellants. I mean, all that is figured into this. Yeah, it's incredible I, how many variables there are for gunnery. 
Yeah, no, it's, I'd say like nothing's changed because even the field artillery uh, tanks, uh, it's it's the same. A lot of the same factors apply, uh, but the greater the range is when you start factoring in the spin of the earth. You know, if you're shooting 20 miles and you got to factor that sort of stuff in. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and these are the problems that they were sorting out into the turn of last century up through the Great Wars. Luke, is that the rangefinder you had at Fleet Week last year? Yep, that's the one, the one I showed. Okay. Good yeah, that's the one that was hanging on my neck as I was walking around the USS New York. I'm about to get to that. Um, anybody else have any questions? Uh, no, I just had something I was going to uh, just briefly add in uh, for the, the, the larger range finders. Uh, a, a good majority of them were calibrated at the Washington Navy Yard. There's an optical tower in the yard. And I think from uh, 1918 or 1919, they started uh, calibrating those larger range finders in the optical tower. And they used the, uh, uh, the, the Capitol, the Washington Monument, and the Masonic Temple in Alexandria as the three fixed positions to help calibrate the, uh, uh, the range finders. Cool. Um, before we bring Tom on, I do want to show you guys something from 10 months ago, since there is no Fleet Week this year. Maybe some of you have seen this before. Uh, let's see. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Living history makes the history of the U.S. Navy come alive for people. It puts more of a real face on the war and sailor life. We can show the textbooks, we can show them photos, but it really doesn't connect like standing in front of them in a historic uniform. It's not just some date, some time. It's something that you personally relate to. It makes it more real for you. All the stuff that we carry in our pockets are things that sailors would have carried 100 years ago. So we can show people here's what they did and how they lived. Showing them the uniform, the personal items. They may not know much about the history, but it's something small and personal to kind of help bring it alive. The number of things that really draw me to living history, there is the community to have with other people. They're all kind of nerds in their own way. You sit down and talk about history, you learn new things every day. It gives me an opportunity to teach people about the interesting things that I've learned to really enrich somebody else's life. One of the common misconceptions about reenactors is that they just go out onto battlefields and have mock battles. I don't really do that much. My favorite thing is to teach the public stand in front of people and show them the history. We get to meet people from around the world, around the United States. And whenever you explain something to them and they say, like, wow, that's really neat. I never knew that. I never knew how that thing worked or how someone did what they did a hundred years ago. That's the most rewarding part to me. All right. Cool. Very cool. Yeah, I mean, the USS Olympia Living History crew just crushed it last year, and the Navy Region Mid-Atlantic just said all good things about the living historians that came. Um, so let's bring on Tom. Yeah, I'd be, uh, be glad to. Uh, one second, I need to go on, go, there we go. <laughs> Had a bunch of hounds basically sitting at me and staring at me for, for, for food. <laughs> So uh, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Tom. I'm the, uh, the Director of Education for the National Museum of the U.S. Navy, also a volunteer on the, uh, the Olympia, which uh, uh, I love helping out with. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking about the land-based operations for the Navy in World War I. Uh, a lot of people don't realize this, that the Navy did have boots on the ground in France, uh, not, just, not, not just with the... Uh, 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 Navy Hospital, Navy Corman, but they had U.S. Navy railroad guns in France, five of them actually, and they were manufactured uh, uh, at the Washington Navy Yard. And so today we're going to go into a little bit of the history of it. Uh, but before we go into the, uh, the I, I do the, uh, the share screen, the, uh, the uniform that I have behind me 
uh, while it's uh, part reproduction, part original with some, some items, uh, it's what the sailors would have worn in France. It's an army uniform, but with a Navy rating on the sleeve. That's how they uh, tried to make themselves stand out within the, uh, the, the AEF. And uh, let me tell you, it helps when going through the photos, trying to pick out the sailors from everybody else. So uh, let me try the, uh, the share screen here, and then I'll uh, dive into it. Uh, let's see. I think it's going. It is not allowing me to do it for some reason. So if, if any of you have the, uh, uh, if you want to go on to the, uh, uh, the, the, Doughboy, uh, uh, the Doughboy page and everything and pull it up, uh, it's basically a slideshow talking about the, uh, the railroad gun itself. Uh, the gun, uh, actually all five of them, again, were manufactured at the Navy Yard. And it's really not a new concept for the, uh, the time period. It's a 14 inch, a uh, 50 caliber battleship gun on a train. And the whole reason why they were manufactured is because the Germans had something like it, where they were basically, uh, they had this these railroad guns that were shelling uh, Dunkirk from uh, Belgium. In fact, uh, uh, from uh, Clerken, Belgium, and Moore, Belgium, about 24 miles away, and they were able to hit Dunkirk. And when the, when the Americans entered the war, uh, the British and the French basically went to the Americans and said, could you make something? Could you get something that could counter battery fire uh, against the Germans? And the Americans went to really who was handling the big guns at the time, but the U.S. Navy. And the Navy went to the U.S. Naval Gun Factory, Washington Navy Yard, where they were making the battleship guns. And they went to the manufacturers there and said, could you design something? Could you, could you make something? And the manufacturers went, well, yeah, we could. We could do that very easily. And uh, what specifically they did was they had spare 14-inch barrels for you know, the, the ships that they had at the time. 14-inch was the standard. They were working on 16-inch gun barrels at that time, but it really wasn't... Uh, it, it, it wasn't up to the, the speed and they didn't have the amount of the 16 inch gun barrels that, the, that they really needed at that point, but they had plenty of 14 inch gun barrels laying around. Uh, so the manufacturers there said, yeah, we could definitely design something. So it was uh, uh, in late 1917 that they started figuring it all out, designing these guns, but not just the guns, but the cars that went along with the guns. And by, let's see, by January of 1918, they had all of the drawings complete. And what they did is they, like they do today, they put it out on contract uh, to uh, uh, build not the gun barrels, but the, 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 the engines and the cars that went along with, the, with each gun. Uh, and it was uh, 13 February that Baldwin Locomotive Company uh, up in Philadelphia, along with the uh, Standard Steel Car Company, uh, they both won the contracts to uh, create the, uh, uh, the, the, the engines and the cars that went along with the guns. And that is when construction started on, on these guns. It's also around that time that uh, Captain C.P. Plunkett, U.S. Navy, requested the command of these railroad guns, and he received the command. And the first mount was completed on uh, uh, 25th April 1918, and that was 120 days from the initial design, so the initial drawings. So very, very quick turnaround time uh, for the first gun mount. And the, that gun was actually brought up to Sandy Hook, New Jersey to be tested. And what they found was that uh, the the elevation on the gun wasn't that bad, but they realized that if they wanted to elevate the gun to, to the full uh, 43 degree angle to get the, the maximum traje trajectory for the, uh, the gun itself, that they actually had to dig a pit underneath the gun, about 15 feet deep, 
so before the gun would actually be brought into battery, they had to dig a pit, bring the train up, and then they would be able to elevate the barrel to the full, uh, f to the full 43 degrees. They found that the gun could fire about 25 and a half miles. Uh, wow. Yeah, so definitely uh, uh, meeting and exceeding a little bit expectations for what the Navy was looking for. They were looking to basically counter battery fire what the Germans had at that time, which could fire 24 miles. Well, this is 25 and a half miles and you know, it, th those, those inches count. Uh, so uh, uh, it, it definitely helped. So from there, four more guns were completed along with all of the cars that go along with the guns. So I'm talking uh, uh, ammunition cars, uh, workshop cars. You also have cook cars so that they could you know, feed all of the sailors. Uh, you also have uh, sleeper cars that have uh, uh, racks kind of like on a ship where they would fold up to the sides during the day and then at night they would fold down and everything too, wire racks. Uh, and they also had anti-aircraft guns uh, along with the train to protect the train as well, uh, along with other cars that had cranes on them, uh, uh, sh uh, just supplies. They, they, the Navy wanted these guns to be self-sufficient. Uh, that they didn't have to bring in more equipment. Everything was with the train. So it was five guns, uh, so five trains that go along with those guns and all of the cars, and then they had a separate amount of uh, uh, cars that went along with them. It was actually broken down into a staff train where they would have a traveling machine, stop, uh, machine shop, uh, uh, a staff quarters car, spare parts, kitchen, commissary, birthing, just for the staff of the, uh, uh, of the railroad guns. And so ev everything was, the, the, the rest of the guns were manufactured, all of the cars, and everything was, was brought up to Philadelphia. And from Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Navy Yard, they were placed aboard ship and shipped over to France. And they arrived at uh, St. Naz Nazary uh, on uh, 29 June, 1918. Everything was unloaded there. All of the, uh, the guns, the cars, everything was reassembled. Uh, and then they were brought uh, sort of north of Paris uh, where they were put into battery. And it was on uh, 6 September, 1918 that they were first fired in France. And they were used to really great effect. Uh, they, they were hitting towns, bridges, railroad crossings, railroad marsh marshalling areas, uh, really any, any place that they could hit that could disrupt uh, uh, German troop movements. Uh, and for their, their use in France, uh, they fired 782 shells over 25 days, and that's for the five guns. And so that, that, that's roughly around uh, uh, 150, 160 rounds per gun bro broken down. And each gun, each gun themselves had a 300 shell life that they would have to basically take out the rifling in the gun and re-rifle the barrel and everything. It was a sleeve that could be inserted into the gun. Uh, and they, they were used to, uh, to great effect. We actually have fit, uh, uh, archival film footage that we play in our museum uh, that, that was taken in France of the guns firing, but also the, uh, uh, the after the war, they went to some of the target areas and were showing some of the damage that these 14 inch shells were doing. And uh, uh, again, they used them to, uh, to great effect. Now, these guns were also some of the last guns firing on the very last day of the war. In fact, uh, uh, Battery 4 uh, fired the last shot of the railroad guns uh, on November 11th, 1918 at 10 o'clock, at 10.57 and 30 seconds. They timed it so that the shell would hit at 11 o'clock. Uh, and that, it's a little vindictive, I think, but understandably so. Um, so the, the, the shell lands and the, the primer for that shell uh, is actually at the uh, uh, American History Museum, Smithsonian, here, here in uh, DC. 
So uh, uh, if you talk to the uh, the collections manager, that maybe they might be able to pull it out and uh, and, and show it to you all. But uh, the the guns themselves, again, were really kind of cool little marvels that they had. Uh, they were attached to the French, to the Americans, uh, for one or two fire missions to the Germans, not to the Germans, they were firing on the Germans, to the British they were attached to. And uh, uh, the batteries, again, were used to great effect uh, during World War I. And what I love is, again, looking at the archival uh, uh, photos and film footage of these guns and just seeing how they operated. They were all manually loaded. Uh, the, the shells themselves, it was block and tackle and pulley systems and uh, uh, rail systems to bring the shells up in, into the gun. Everything was manually rammed in along with all of the powder bags and, and everything as well. And uh, for recoil, uh, they, the trains didn't move at all. They actually had the braking system that locked down. And when the gun fired, you could see the gun physically recoil, but it had a uh, recoil system within the train that absorbed the shock. That and because they had to dig a pit underneath the train, uh, uh, they didn't really want the train rolling because it would damage the gun and uh, uh, the breach and everything. And uh, uh, so, so th there's photos and it, it, if you go through the slideshow that I put up, you can see in the photos, there's sailors standing on top of the train as the gun is firing. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's, again, really interesting stuff to uh, uh, see. Uh, the guns themselves were also inspected by uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, when they were in France. And uh, there, there's photos of him checking out the guns. Uh, Plunkett actually gave him a tour of the, the operations, and he actually did uh, view them firing in France uh, dur during his tour. And uh, the other thing, too, is that, uh, uh, and you can see this in the photos, there's a, uh, there's a group of officers in one of the shots. And uh, if you look very closely at the shortest officer there standing in the center, uh, he is holding a Jack Russell Terrier. Uh, that Terrier's name was Cognac. Uh, he was their mascot. And uh, for, for those of you who don't know, I'm kind of the dog guy. So I like showing off the, uh, the, the, the different dogs throughout history including the one who's kind of making noise behind me and playing with a toy when he's trying to, trying to have him be quiet. Uh, but uh, Cognac was uh, hung out with the officers and the enlisted was known to uh, basically sleep in any open bed that looked comfortable. Uh, it, sadly though, he did not survive the war. Uh, a, a week or two before the war ended, uh, they were moving the guns to another, uh, another area that they would be able to fire them from. And uh, sadly, he was hit by a train uh, and again, did not survive the war. But you can see a picture of Cognac uh, in, in the, uh, the very last slide of the, uh, the presentation there. So uh, the, uh, oh yeah, the, one other thing, Sparky, stop it. <laughs> Excuse me. Puppies, what can I tell you? Uh, the, the guns themselves, uh, people always ask me, uh, uh, you know, how much of a traverse did they have? Two degrees left, two degrees right. That, that's, that, that was it. Because they're firing at a fixed target. And usually when they would fire, uh, you would have uh, all five guns kind of lined up. And the French had railroad spurs already built out. Uh, if they needed to, tra to traverse the guns, uh, the, the, the spurs were kind of already on a curve. So if they needed to kind of redirect the guns, they could pull them back to another area and fire into a, uh, uh, into a new position. Uh, and sadly today, there's only one gun left. Uh, it's located at the Washington Navy Yard, just outside of my museum. Uh, if you ever come down to Washington, D.C. and you want to see it in person, it's, uh, it's, it's quite an impressive piece. Uh, you, you can see the operation of it as well. Uh, if you want to elevate the barrel, it's a manual crank on the side. And they would have one lowly sailor outside of the gun handling that crank, basically cranking the gun up into position, firing the gun, and then he would crank it back down to depress the barrel. Uh, it, was, it was hard work, but uh, the, the sailors definitely 
use these guns to, uh, to, to great precision. So uh, that's a, a, a little bit about the, uh, the, the US Navy railroad guns in France. Uh, I am definitely open to any questions if folks have any. Uh, and definitely check out the, uh, the, the, the little slideshow that I uh, put out there because you can see some of the blueprints, but also the guns being manufactured at the Washington Navy Yard and uh, being used in France along with their crews wearing their army uniforms with their Navy rates. And uh, you can also see some Naval officers still wearing their blues and everything too in France. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. Tom, how many guys um, were assigned to the guns? How many sailors? We're on the detail. Uh, so for each gun, uh, you basically had, it was, uh, a, I think it was 175 per battery, so per train. Uh, and that was something that they could also, if they needed more guys, they could pull them from the staff car, from the, uh, uh, the staff train as well, because they, they had extra sailors on the staff trains. Cool. Mm -hmm. Where is the uh, the slideshow? I didn't see it on the website. Is it? Uh, it's on the, uh, the the East Coast Doughboys uh, uh, page, and I, I can also put it on the. Uh, uh, in fact, let me do that now. The uh, the World War One uh, Historical Association East chapter too. That would be great. Thank you. Yeah, because I'm on the East Coast Doughboys .com on the gallery right now. Is it somewhere on a different? No, site? it's it's not on the website. It's on the Facebook group. Oh, in the Facebook group. Oh, yeah. okay. Got it. I'll share it there. Okay. Yeah. You Here's, I don't know if you can see out. this. This is a little book, the, uh, oh, wow. the United States Naval Railway Batteries in France. Yep. In and... fact, uh, <laughs> I, I, I work for the Naval History and Heritage Command, so the, the Naval History Center, and they also came out with uh, this right here, which I don't know if you can see, but it has all of the blueprints uh, for the trains themselves, along with uh, different maps and everything. When did yeah. they come out with that? Uh, probably uh, late 80s. There's okay. not many of them left. Okay. But it also has, uh, uh, let me see if I can uh, get it up to the camera there. It has the blueprints for the toilets on the trains as well. <laughs> Yeah. My biggest question as a as a battlefield visitor yeah. has been trying to find the actual spots where the gun pits were dug. Yeah. And the maps. Does is that available in the Naval Archives? Uh I believe so. Uh if you contact the Naval History and Heritage Command, they should have uh because again, they're the ones uh uh who came out with all of this stuff and they have the maps of uh of where the batteries were used at. Uh, so they might be able to uh, track down the originals as to where they where exactly they were assigned. Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm looking at, you know, very detailed, not yeah. just a map of the Meurs area of France. With, well, they, you they, know, they should be able to uh, track down the original maps, and if not, at least the, uh, the, the, the records books for the, uh, the batteries. Okay. Because we're, we're, we're the Navy's history department, so if we don't have that stuff, it'll make me extremely sad. <laughs> Oh, cool. the question is, is that open to the public? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, you would have to contact them. If you go on the, uh, the Naval History and Heritage Command's website, uh, the, okay. there's how to contact us. So uh, yep. right now, it may be a little bit more difficult to actually come and see us. Right. Uh, <laughs> but uh, maybe once this is all uh, said and done, you'd definitely be able to come on down and uh, check out the, uh, the archives and uh, the Navy's library, too. That would be great. Thank you. Cool. So something to add to that, the uh, Pennsylvania Railroad actually operated some of the trains that pulled these naval guns around. Mm -hmm. So uh, the records, the extant records of the Pennsylvania Railroad are with the Pennsylvania State Archives in Harrisburg, PA. And there's also pieces with my institution, which is Hagley Museum and Library in Wilmington, Delaware. So uh, if you want to research it from the railroad end, you know, there's a couple of avenues of approach for that too. Thank you. Yeah. I like the Fort Hancock connection too, um, and Sandy Hook. Yeah, and uh, uh, the, there was an account where it was basically when they fired the guns, you know, they, they weren't expecting it to go as far and it just kind of sh shocked some of the officers who were there, but there were lowly enlisted who were just like, yeah, we knew it was gonna do that. But, uh, you know, 
that, oh. that, that's the enlisted for you bragging about everything. <laughs> welcome, Eddie. Welcome, Todd. Hey. Okay. And uh, for for those of you who want to see him, if it, if he'll wake up, Sawyer, come. I'm counting six or seven dogs now. Yeah. So Laura, here's you've got one. Yeah. Here's the retired guy. Oh, there he is. Yeah. Okay. Mike, do you have two? You have two or three? <laughs> Jared's got a cat. <laughs> the just trying to take a nap. Very pet friendly. Yeah. We've got we've got two cats, whiskey and soda. They're just have, not around uh, me right now. Mr. Luck is home here somewhere. With our black cat. And here's Sparky, the young guy. He's only with us for a few more months. Hey, Sparky. It's yeah. Sparky. Thomas, another question on the uh, guns. Yeah. Hubble was involved with them, correct? I'm I'm can't find the the track of that. I thought he was involved with the naval guns. He might have been involved with artillery in general in World War One. Uh I think he's in the Hubble of the Hubble I telescope. I think he's artillery in general. I would have to double go back through uh through my research and double check, but I don't remember seeing his uh, his information through uh, through my research. Okay, I can't remember where I saw that. Maybe it was in um, oh God, Lawrence Stalling's book, The Doughboys. I'm going to have to go look after this. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't remember seeing his name in conjunction with Navy artillery at all. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if, if anybody ever has a chance to pick up the uh, the United States Na Naval Railway ba Battery in France. It's definitely a, a good read. Has a lot of good good photos, especially of uh, the interiors of uh, the the guns and uh, uh, some of the cars and everything. It also has the breakdown of where the bat where the batteries are at, how many rounds that they fired, uh, and the construction of the uh, the guns themselves. And uh, you know, like I told about the uh, the the birthing areas in the car. So you can see the racks that basically f fold up against the, uh, the, the walls and everything there. It's downloadable as a PDF now. That I is. don't remember the site, but you know, it, Dr. Google will know. Yeah, and it's probably through the Naval History and Heritage Command. I think they have it uh, downloadable there too. Yeah. yeah. Cool. It's, it's a great, it, it's a fascinating read and a very unique section of, or, or piece of World War I Amer AEF efforts. Yeah. Any other questions at all, or? Uh... That was awesome. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. Mm -hmm. Any feedback, anybody? Thanks to both of the speakers. Great. Yeah. Well, next week, uh, Laura is going to be Tom? one of our guests. Do I give a preview, Laura? Well, I have been working on a, a slideshow and actually recording some uh, narration for another uh, project. Uh, the teacher friend who has requested some World War One content. Uh, so by the time I get that finished, I should be really good at giving this presentation. But I'll probably throw in a few more fun uh, photos for you guys. Uh, Great. And I'm working on a special guest. Ooh. Um, I don't have any other news. I'm still working on, um, you know, wait and see with our different events. No, you know, just like everybody else, just on a wait and see mode. It's mm -hmm. a bummer. Yeah. Anybody working on any projects or anything cool? I'm working on some suffragist stuff and still working on my World War I food administration things. I'm making videos for the Navy to post on our website because we don't have uh, wireless internet in the museum. So I, I have to get a little creative with, uh, with what we do. <laughs> well, I want to thank Ed for doing the logo for the Historical Association. It's really nice. Everything was very educational. Yes. Is that John? 
Yes. Hey, John, thanks for joining today. My pleasure. Hopefully we get to you at one of our Living History events when uh, we're beyond all this uh, pandemic. That, that sounds good. I plan on seeing you at Bethel. Yeah, so right now that hasn't been canceled. So fingers crossed that the July event is still on at the uh, uh, Golden Age Air Museum. Uh, two days of camping would be really nice to do in July in Pennsylvania. Right. It's a fantastic airplane. museum too. It's good. Oh yeah, yeah. We uh, so Gab used to volunteer there, and uh, one of our really good friends, he uh, he's one of the pilots there. So they they actually fly all the planes and everything. Uh, what what all do they have there anyway? They had an albatross. They have a Fokker triplane, and they have a Sopwith, <laughs> and they also have a couple other in vehicles. A couple of them are post-war, like in ambulance, I think from the 1920s. And um, they also bring out a lot of vintage vehicles that some of the museum um, members own. So I'm sure that they'll want to bring some of those other vehicles out for the July event, pending that it happens. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to I'm planning to bring my new pyramid tent. There's also an outdoor shower, too. <laughs> And there's a dance. Oh yeah, yeah. the hanger dance. So bring yeah. your significant other, do some dancing. Just want to make a mention. Uh, the VFW magazine published that article this past week. Yes. So that did that has also happened in this past week. So for those of you that get VFW magazine, Kevin was able to hook up a couple of us to uh, speak to them about veterans that do uh, you know living history or recreation type stuff. So. It's actually a pretty cool article. I actually got pretty good feedback from people that got it and then started sending me messages in the mail, <laughs> in the email about it, saying, what the hell is this? Why are you on this magazine in my house? <laughs> <laughs> You're on the cover. That's awesome. Weird. It's weird. Well, what's funny is the, um, the hookup came through the, the commission, and I knew I was only going to give them World War I reenactors. I didn't mention anything, anything else. So, but then it started coming out, okay, there's World War II, there's Vietnam and stuff. So, but we had a very good showing of three of our group. It was really nice. Um, it's not online yet, but I'm, I expect it will be really soon. Um, Don, do you want to in, uh, invite them to your event that's coming up uh, the first week in April? Oh yeah, if I can uh, figure out how to, how to do everything. Um, this is interesting. I just see your, your face right now. I don't see anybody else's. Um, go to um, gallery view. Uh, the view options, I'm clicking on it. it everything just froze. Huh. Um, if you go to um, gallery view. Yeah, I don't have gallery view right now. Every, it's just a little picture of you. And it says, you're reviewing Kevin's screen. <laughs> and that's the only thing that is, uh, is here. Are you on an iPad? No, I'm on my laptop. It, this, I was watching everybody, and then it just all disappeared. Now it's all just you. In the top right, does it say um, gallery view? Or is it on speaker view? Uh, he disappeared. <laughs> I think we may have lost him. Uh, yeah, well, Don, Don does it. He's going to do an online version of his Green Fairy Absinthe Night. Oh. Um, <laughs> the first Thursday in April. So if you like drinking absinthe or want to know anything about absinthe, and he usually has a jazz performance and a burlesque performance, um, wear vintage clothing. It's, it's a real good time. And he usually has it in... Uh, the East Village. Um, it's been going on for a couple of years now. Um, I know Ed's gone, uh, but it's a, it's a fun time. He has a good community. But um, I'll put the link up. Um, going a little bit long. But uh, thanks everybody for tuning in. Uh, next week, same time. Uh, Laurel Beard Guest, we have another person I'm working to confirm. Um, have a great week, everybody.
Yeah, you do. Do. Thank you for setting this up. Yep. Yeah. Thank you, Kevin. Oh, thanks, Here's Kevin. Don's back. Don, where, I was just giving him the lowdown yeah. on um, the Green Ferry. Oh, yeah. We're going to try to do a uh, on online thing at Zoom, if I can figure out Zoom. Uh, <laughs> I, I think I, I thought I had it figured out until just now when suddenly everything just disappeared um, without me doing anything. Well, so. you, you did the uh, IT approved, turn it off, turn it back on again method, so. <laughs> uh, well, what happened is I went back on to the, uh, the main Zoom page and then it just disconnected me um, automatically without me even hitting leave meeting. So I'll just have to be, it's, I think Zoom is kind of like a very precarious Chinese vase sitting on a, on a 